This is a, a B24. How many of you knew that? Show of hands. <laughs> okay, so you've been paying attention. This is actually a, a pretty famous B24. This particular airplane, and this is a, a painting, but, but this particular aircraft is of Witchcraft. Now, Witchcraft was a B24H that was built at Ford's Willow Run factory in Michigan. She rolled off the assembly line early in 1943 and uh, she was ferried from there to Wendover, Utah, Wendover Army Airfield in Utah, which is still an Air Force base. It is a bleak, bleak place, but it was great for training bombers. And, uh, and, and so at that time, she rolled out, she went to the uh, 467th Bomb Group, brand new. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this airplane. And then, and then the, the second story will follow. And all of it came together. And it's interesting because this, the history of this airplane is pretty well documented. Uh, she had a fabulous history. She's no longer with us. Uh, but, but her history has been, has been very well documented in the past. What nobody thinks about is what got her so famous, what made the airplane so famous, what made it possible for the airplane to achieve the accomplishments that she became known for. So, in the package that I found uh, was the two squadrons, or the squadron and the group that the airplane was assigned, with, uh, assigned to. This is the uh, 467th Bomb Group, 790th Bomb Squadron. Now, a bomb group in 1944 usually comprised four <coughs> squadrons, as did the, the uh, 467th. Each squadron had 18 aircraft and about 22 crew assigned. There were, at one time, 72 bomb groups. That was a lot of airplanes that were, that were in operation. And, and of the 72 heavy bomb groups, the, the bulk of them in 44 were in England with the 8th Air Force, although there were some with the 9th as well. And there were some in the Pacific. This is the earliest known photograph of witchcraft. This is right after her delivery to the bomb squadron at Wendover, when she was uh, delivered to the, uh, to the uh, 790th. No nose art on the airplane, the paint's fairly fresh. This is just a lot code number. It's nothing, nothing personal yet. This fellow right here is George Reed. He was the assigned pilot for this particular airplane. And uh, during the course of her missions, he flew about 62 of the missions on this particular airplane. Uh, survived the war and, uh, and was a regular attendee with many of the conventions post-war. This is the original flight crew assigned to the plane. They also uh, were assigned to this airplane through its entire career. Now, this particular B-24H, which is essentially identical to a B-24J, the H and the J tended to indicate, where, uh, didn't tend, they, were, they indicated where the airplane was built. In this particular case, it's a Ford built H. If it had been built in San Diego, it would have been a J. Uh, it gets confusing, the nomenclature on B-24s, because they were also built by Douglas, and they, it's, 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 it's a real puzzle trying to figure them out if you can't see the serial number on an airplane. Fortunately, this one's pretty well, uh, pretty well identified. Arrived at Wendover in the spring. It went through intensive training with the group. They had one of the most rigid COs in this group. His name was Showers, Colonel Showers. Showers was notorious in the, in the Air Force for his ramrod straight, absolute devotion to duty and to military decorum which was sort of unusual amongst bomb groups who had a tendency to be a little more casual than that. And um, he actually had quite an interesting record. Uh, Showers was one of very few CEOs for a bomb group who was with it from its inception till its disestablishment. And uh, that's, that's fairly unusual. Most of them would serve for a period of time and then be relieved. Uh, Showers saw them through. He also attended a lot of the conventions post-war, and he was not a popular guy during training, partly because of his absolute demand for insistence on 
on, uh, on, on uh, regulations. And he pushed them very hard when it came to training. But post-war, he was quoted as having said that if he got one more guy back alive at the end of the war, then all of that had been worthwhile. And interestingly, some place during the war, he went from being incredibly unpopular to being actually everybody's favorite CO. So he had an, an interesting legacy, and a, quite, a, quite a fellow. After training, the airplane left the United States, uh, it left Wendover in January, flew to Florida, and in February, the group left, uh, twos, threes, fours, and they went by the southern route through Brazil, across through the Azores, to North Africa, and thence up to the UK. This airplane arrived at RAF Rackheath, which was going to be its home base in, uh, in England in March. <coughs> Excuse me. In March of 44. So this airplane's history actually starts, its combat history doesn't start until it flies its first mission on the 10th of April, 1944. Bear in mind, the war is going to be ending in May, but just a year, just a little over a year later. In that year, Witchcraft and her associated crews completed 130 complete missions. No aborts, no technicals that kept her from launching. And in fact, she actually launched 132 times, but two of the flights were recalls because of weather over the target. So they got all the way out there and turned around and came back, jettisoned bombs over the, over the North Sea or, or the English Channel and landed. So she, she actually flew all of 130 actual deliveries. So 130 missions, that was a record. It was a record for B-24s. That's more missions than any other single B-24 flew. And it was a record for the 8th Air Force. And it all happened. In all, in all the way through 1944, which was the highest loss rate period of time for the 8th Air Force during World War II. It's really quite extraordinary. Never hit by flak, never hit by fire uh, from fighters. None of her crew was ever injured or, or, or suffered any other casualties. It's quite a remarkable record. And these guys flew, as I said, Reed flew 62 of the missions. This was, this was uh, his crew. He, they were with him on most of those missions. The odds against all of that happening were pretty extraordinary. The United States bombers in Europe suffered 10,000 aircraft losses. Most of those airplanes had 10 people aboard. The Army Air Forces in, gen in overall lost 53,007 men to operational losses. That was more than the Navy and the Marine Corps combined during the war. Just staggering numbers of people. Staggering numbers. Some of it's due to poor strategy, but the bulk of it is due to really, really difficult odds, heavily defended targets, carefully defended targets. It was really an amazing number, and, and you know, you watch a movie like 12 O'Clock High today, and you see Gregory Peck dealing with the losses, and that was real. That's really how it must have been. That must have been very much like it felt. So it's an amazing feat to have accomplished 130 missions. This is the airplane uh, photographed over Holland on her way out on a mission, and that's, that's witchcraft. In a, in a formation on a bombing flight. And this is her on the hard stand. Uh, this picture was taken August 8th, so this is about uh, five months after she'd arrived in, 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 at Rackheath. At this point, she's got quite a few mission marks on it, and she's been given the name. I, I've always thought this three was interesting. I don't know exactly why it's there. I don't think that's the number three engine. It's either one or four. But, it's, it's curious, possibly just a replacement cowling. This picture drove me crazy for a while because this was in the collection that I was dealing with, and I could not for the life of me figure out why these airplanes were set up this way. Why are they not dispersed? Why are they so close together? And then I thought, oh, maybe it's the end of the war and it's time to fly them back to the U.S. Maybe that's what they were doing. But that wasn't it. It turned out that on magnification, if you look real closely, these are not suitcases piled underneath them. 
they're jerry cans. Now, the, the 467th, along with a number of other bomb groups, as the Allied forces started to rampage across France and toward Germany, outstripped the fuel supplies, and a lot of these bomb groups started flying what they called truck missions. Now, they didn't count as combat missions. They didn't, so they, <laughs> according to my records, this particular airplane flew over 20 of these things, and they're not counted amongst the 130 missions. Those 130 were really true combat missions. These were basically trucking missions where they were carrying equipment, supplies, mostly fuel. And that's why they're parked this way, is so that they could quickly load the truck the, from the trucks into the aircraft. <coughs> this is, this airplane, right there, that's witchcraft park back there. So, this particular airplane and, and her various crews flew every mission that the 467 flew when they were in Europe. From the very first mission on the 19th, uh, or on the 10th of April in 44, to the very last mission on the 25th of April, 1945. 130 missions in a year. The, the math is pretty interesting. She flew a lot of missions. A lot of them are clustered up around June, July, the summer of 44. A ton of them are against uh, interdiction targets in, uh, in and around, North, first around Cherbourg. This is kind of interesting from a historical standpoint. If you look at her mission log, in late May, she flew a lot of interdiction missions around um, the Pas de Calais. Quite a few. She and basically against targets like railroad marshalling yards, bridges, those kinds of targets, which is not not a, a casual target for a heavy bomb group. The next month in June. It's almost twice as many missions, all against the same type of targets, but encircling Normandy. And how it factors into the bigger strategy of the war is really interesting, because in May, Eisenhower was trying to convince the Germans that he was going to invade Pas de Calais. So of course they were flying missions in Pas de Calais to draw German attention to that area. But a month later, after the invasion had taken place, the activity sh shifted to where the battle was really raging. And, and she racked up quite a few missions down there in France. But a little later, this would be probably the fall of 1944, uh, pushing in or getting closer to uh, uh, the winter as they were starting to get closer to the Battle of Bul Bulge period. Uh, it's interesting because these airplanes were not, there's, some, are, some are olive drab, some are natural metal. Uh, that's how they were delivered. They weren't stripping the paint as time went by. Um, they just had mixed equipment. Now this is the flight and ground crew of the airplane. And they've got, they've all got, this, this was their 120th mission. And each one of these guys, there's 12 guys in the picture, they all have 10 fingers up. 120 missions. Pretty impressive. Um, Question? Yes, sir. What about the 25 mission rule for rotation? That that all went away in 42 and 43, or late 42 yeah. and into 43. Yeah. Um, did, uh, Reed, right here, flew the first and the last mission. Now, he never flew 130. I think his total mission count was, I think he flew about 60 missions total. I think. I would have to, I'd have to, to do some research to get the actual date that the 25 mission rule went away. But it went away, yeah, I think, sometime at 43. Hmm. It, it also led to, if you notice the peak caps that the guys are wearing, the sides are down. <coughs> they used to call that the 50 mission crush because they wear their headsets. Yeah, yeah. This. So, uh, witchcraft. The war ended in, in May of 45. Uh, her mission, her last mission was the 25th of April. Uh, the airplane sat in England for a little while. The crew uh, flew her back to the United States. She landed at Bradley Field, Connecticut. Uh, they checked in at the line office as they walked off the ramp, and that was the last time they ever saw the airplane. 
They had lived in or with that airplane at that point for almost two years. The airplane was, um, it wasn't demilled, but they removed all of the weapons from the aircraft at that time. She was flown to Willow Grove for public display, and it was on display at Willow Grove for a couple of months. And then she was ferried to Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, uh, as were uh, so many other B-24s. And in 1946, she was scrapped. This is a picture of them lined up. You can see uh, there are a few olive drab airplanes sprinkled in amongst the silver. Some of these airplanes were brand new, right out of the factory, and, and many of them, many, many of them were returning vets. So that's, that's sort of the story of uh, witchcraft. I didn't know the story. I'm, I've practiced mostly naval history, but it was really interesting to read the odds against this airplane achieving what it achieved. And you start to wonder, how is that even possible? The most unlikely person is one of the people responsible. One of the pictures, that I, the first picture that popped out to me was this one. This was a formal portrait inside a folder. This man is George E. Dong. Now, I've got to tell you, when I look at crew shots, when I look at maintenance shots, I almost never see ethnic uh, diversity in the picture. This guy stood out. First of all, in, in the box of goodies, I didn't have a picture of the actual box, but it, it was a paper bag and a box. And in the box, you opened up this box, and it was like a box you'd get a shirt in and as a gift. It was a belt. This guy's waist must have been about this big. There were patches, there were name tags from various conventions, and then there were some portraits that looked like this. And then there was an, an album. Now, the album is where the gold usually is, but not entirely. A lot of this man's history was in the paperwork. George E. Dong was born in 1907 in Bakersfield, California. By 1920, his family had relocated to San Diego and was living in National City. About 1940, the family moved again, this time to Coronado, where they bought a house on C Street. Dong had attended Roosevelt High School, just down the street here, right over by the zoo, and took mainly mechanical engineering classes. When he graduated from high school, he went to work for Mission, it was called the Mission Garage, and it was on Girard Street in La Jolla. And he worked there from graduation until he enlisted in the Army in 1942. And, uh, and the Army wisely made him a mechanic. It's so funny because you, you run into guys who were bakers, who end up gunners, and, and guys who were skeet shooters, who end up bakers in the Army. George ended up as a mechanic, as he probably should have been. And George initially went, he went through basic training, and then he went to, um, he went to uh, Seymour Johnson Army Air Base and was, tra was uh, trained in Army mechanics. He was qualified to be a mechanic on A-20s, BT-13s, and 15s, the B-25, initial training on the B-24, also on the AT-6. He was then forwarded to Willow Run, where he re received specialized training on the Liberator, the B-24 Liberator. And on completion of that training, in the summer of 44, or sorry, summer of 43, he was transferred to Wendover, Utah, where he met Lieutenant Reed, his new boss, Witchcraft, who didn't have a name yet, and a lifelong friend, this guy right here, whose name was Joe Ramirez. Now, his real name is Jose Ramirez, but Joe Ramirez was the crew chief for this airplane. And Joe was from uh, uh, Los Angeles. Now, I have very little information on Joe, and I really wish I knew more about him. But he was the crew chief on the airplane. This is Don, George Don, and Don was the assistant crew chief. And these guys are all additional mechanics, second, third, and fourth mechanic, or second, third, and fourth mechanic. I think one of them is armor. But all of these were all non-flying crew for the aircraft. 
Didn't mean they didn't fly on the airplane. They flew on the airplane on its way to England. They flew it back to, to the U.S. at the end of the war. We know that Dong flew on several of the truck missions as well. But these guys were the reason that that airplane was able to have 130 missions without a single abort. I mean, that's just incredible. Because these guys were changing push rods. They would change, on average, 12 push rods per mission. That's how quickly these airplanes were going through push rods. Mm. And interestingly enough, if you uh, look at the Collins Foundation, who maintains a B-24 today, look at their, their website, they're changing push rods like nobody's business. Mm. It's just one of those pieces of the airplane, that, uh, the engine, that wears out the most quickly. Uh, Joe, Joe Ramirez, uh, Don, um, I, I just, I really like this picture because there they are with their charge and they're really, they took a lot of pride in this. They, they are responsible for this airplane's achievements. And Don, as I said, he lived here in Coronado. Um, on the completion of the 120th mission, the entire ground staff were given citations, and Dong and uh, Dong and the rest of them were taken by train to London. This is General Kepner, who was in charge, who was the CO of the Second Air Division. Second Air Division controlled this particular group of bombers, and he's giving Dong uh, his citation in this picture. They had a week's leave in London, based on the pictures that are in the the, uh, the scrapbook. They had a great time. <laughs> They did not get a lot of leaves like that, I don't think, and, and, I, and, I, and, it, and it's, it's really pretty neat to see. The other thing that's interesting is, is how tattered the uniform is. There are great big holes in it, the bridges are, and you know, it's, these guys flew and fought with what they had to a large degree, and supplies weren't always easy or, or in, in, uh, in large, uh, large availability. Fascinating. Kepner. This was a big media opportunity because 120 missions at the time was kind of a big deal. And, and the war is, the war is not, doesn't have too much longer to go. Now, when, Don, when the war ended, as I said, Don flew back with the airplane to Bradley, Connecticut. He was mustered out and, uh, in August of 45, and he returned back, returned to Coronado, where he got a job almost right away. Uh, Naval Air Station San Diego, where he worked at the rework facility and specialized in uh, PB4Y privateer and liberator uh, reconditioning. And of course, he was it was an aircraft he was intimately familiar with at this point. Uh, he also got to enjoy his favorite passions, which were fishing, and he belonged to a lodge group. And uh, I don't know my cars that well. I don't know what that is. 54 Mercury. Well, there you go. So, so uh, about nine years later, he's got himself a pretty nice looking Merc. And, uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a very cool suit. And a great hat. Yeah, great hat. Gotta love the hat. Yes, sir. What was his ethnic background? Chinese. Okay. Yeah. Chinese. Uh, his father uh, was not U.S., was not born in this country. Oh. Uh, 39 pounds, 8 ounces. <laughs> what about the fish? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can see what I meant about the guy's waist. He's, a, he's a, 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 not a big guy. Um, obviously, VFW was very important to him. This is a parade. Uh, this building, these buildings are all still there on, on uh, Orange in, San, in uh, Coronado. In 61, he retired. Uh, from government service, so from 42 to 61, he had been in almost <clears throat> continuous government service. He retired from uh, San Diego. He had been awarded uh, several citations while he had been wor working there for creativity and for um, uh, 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 thorough job done. He, he, uh, he, was, he must have been very popular with the with the with the boss. Uh, Shorty appears to be the name of the. Uh, officer giving him the award. He also stayed very deeply involved with the 467th Bomb Group. Joe Ramirez, change sides here, that's Joe Ramirez, uh, uh, George Dong, 
And the guy in the middle is George Reed, the pilot of the airplane. And uh, uh, so these, there are tons of pictures like this in there. Um, a couple of these things. This is this is on the occasion of George's 90th birthday. Uh, this young lady is his niece. This is his brother. This is his niece. And his niece wrote him a letter and a picture drawn in crayon when he was in, in the UK. And that was in the box of documents with a picture from his niece to him telling telling him that, and she was, she was quite young at the time, told him that she hoped he was well and that she missed him and please come home soon. This is the last picture I have of them. This is it's a great picture. It's a, I believe it's taken at the Hotel Dell. This is one of their conventions. Um, George passed away in uh, 1999 and Joe Ramirez passed away in 2001. Um, George's family brought a couple of, as I said, a box and a bag in that said Uncle, Uncle George's stuff on it. Now, George never married, so the family had his stuff in a box and a bag in the corner of a garage, garage or a, uh, a closet someplace and brought it into us. It had been lovingly preserved or lo lovingly cared for. It had not been... Uh, it, it was in good shape considering how old it was and and as nice and touching as that picture is this is how I think of George when I think of it he hand colored the tail of this black and white photograph that's how much this meant to him this part of his life meant to him and it's stuff like this that I come into the museum for it's stuff like this that I look at that table for every Friday morning and I'm blessed to be able to do that. And I'm lucky to be able to share it with you because you guys know now that there was a really diverse group of people who made success possible, and it's always that way. Any questions? You want to talk about the Collings Foundation? Oh, Collings Foundation. So next time the Collings Foundation comes to town, They'll bring this B-24 with them. Now, this is not, first of all, it's not an H. Secondly, it's not, not witchcraft. Witchcraft, as I said, was scrapped in, in 46. This is a J. This particular airplane was built uh, against an, uh, an American Army Air Force uh, uh, contract and then was provided to the British and sent to the Far East, where it was um, used by the Southeast Asian Command until the end of the war, at which point it was abandoned. And by abandoned, I mean abandoned. Now, the terms of when lease were kind of simple. When an airplane, when, when the, the leased country was done with the airplane, they could do one of two things with it. It could be returned to US control, or it could be destroyed on site with the previous agreement of the US. Now, the US did not want these airplanes back at that point. They didn't need them. They had enough airplanes to scrap already. So this airplane was uh, parked in a large lot near Lahore in India. And there were hundreds of them, Li quite honestly, hundreds and hundreds of them. Now, the terms of lend lease was that the airplanes had to be destroyed, right? So what the British did was they had all these airplanes in a big pool, so they started driving bulldozers in there and breaking the tails off the airplanes because that would render them inoperable. But they couldn't get into the center of the circle. So some of the airplanes managed to survive the slaughter. What happened when the British left India in 48 was that these airplanes are still sitting there. The Indian Air Force scrapped all the airplanes on the outer corners, but in the center there were some airplanes that were undamaged. And they continued to operate those airplanes into the 1960s. This is one of them. So these airplanes, about 68-ish, they decided to donate some of these airplanes to, uh, to various museums or sold them for next to nothing. There's one on display at the Canadian uh, War Memorial. There's one on display up here at March Air Force Base. Kermit Weeks has one. Collings Foundation's got one of them. 
they're, they're scattered around. The one that's up at, if you've ever been to the Castle Air Force Base Museum, their B-24 is one of the ex-Indian airplanes. Pima. Pima's got one. Yeah, same thing. In fact, Pima, for many years, had Indian markings on one side and U.S. markings on the other. Still does. Still does, so uh, uh, a tribute to their heredity. This is the actual Collins Foundation airplane, which is currently the only active B-24J. And, and uh, there, is a, there is an LB-30 that flies it as well. It's owned by the Commemorative Air Force. And they call it a B-24D, but it's not. And um, uh, so when you think about the B-24, and I'm sure you, all you docents must know this, the B-24 was built in staggeringly large numbers. Uh, more numbers than, than any other bomber, and I think any other single fighter. And, and in spite of what B-17 guys will tell you, it's actually a, an extraordinarily capable airplane. First of all, it was faster than, quite a bit faster than a B-17. A B-24 with an engine out was still faster than a B-17 with four engines running. It had longer range. It didn't have quite the same ceiling, but close, certainly close enough for what it needed for, for combat. Um, it was a, just a horrible airplane to crash land if you didn't have landing gear. But you're going to get that from any airplane with a high wing design, and you're going to get a larger bomb bay because of that high wing design, which this airplane had. The, the old joke about living in the boxes the B-17s came from is not, <laughs> isn't, isn't good. It's not right. This is a, a, a wonderful airplane, a fabulous airplane. We did do we did a, a oral history recently that was fascinating. We had a guy who flown these thing, or uh, uh, engineer on these airplanes in Italy, where the working conditions were just atrocious, especially mud, mud and rain and cold. And so he was in central Italy. They were flying missions up toward. They were flying over over Austria and and up toward the Brenner Pass and. And maintenance on the B-24 was never exactly easy, and uh, especially hydraulics and, and, and systems that ran through the wings. And this guy wrote in his diary, when this war is over, I'm going to buy one of these bastards and park it in my backyard and throw rocks at it for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was just hilarious. So when he came in to do the oral history, the, the interviewer asked him if he still felt that way, and he goes, nah, it brought me home. So I think sort of like Colonel Showers, these things had a way of growing on you. That B-24 comes around to San Diego about every April. Yeah, yeah, that's part of the usual schedule. It was just here. It was yeah. just here. It uh, usually goes up to Carlsbad, and for a few hundred bucks, you can go for a ride on it. Um, I. I use this picture because the other picture has sponsorships written all over the side of it, so you can't really tell what it is. Uh, I love I love this particular photograph. It shows the airplane at its best. Question. Oh, in 1941, they had an assembly line in uh, at Convair. I worked on that assembly line. I put instruments in the P-24s. There you go. And the PBYs. And the PBYs. Another one of my favorites. Oh yeah. A question, sir. Did you ever find an origin as to why they named it from which craft? That 130 missions. This is probably one of the most famous B-24s, mm -hmm. short of Lady Be Good, which was a real B-24D, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is is pretty well known. <coughs> Unlike one of the jokes amongst B, the B-24 B-17 community is that the B-17 had an extra seat for the publicist. <laughs> Yeah, it, which yeah. is the reason the B-17 was, was in 1946, there was a study done by Time Magazine for the most recognized airplane. The B-17 was number one. Not the DC, I would have thought it would have been the DC-3. It wasn't the DC-3, it wasn't the Mustang. It was the B-17, which is, is you know, is maybe, maybe where that publicist's seat comes from. The B-24 did not have that level of press, and, and you know, it was a long-serving bomber. It served post-war for some time in, in roles not bombing related. Yes, Bob? Um, how, did, did, it was it comparable to the B-17 in a number of planes and missions? I mean, did, were there more B-17s <laughs> than flying? Uh, it, uh, there is a B-17 that flew close to the same number of missions. No, no, I mean in... Oh, in no. 
No, no. B-24 flew many more missions than B-17. Uh, did they have more B-24 planes than they had B-17? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, as I said earlier, more of these were built than any other bomber. Why do they call it witchcraft? I, I, no clue. No idea where the name came from. Normally there's some kind of direct link to the name. Don't know. Popular song, perhaps. Somebody asked me recently why there were more B-24s flown in the South Pacific than the B-17s. That, that was the range. It, 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 originally, they said it was because of the range. That is not necessarily the case. Um, the airplanes actually have fairly similar range. The, there's a couple hundred miles difference. You know, that might be enough to make a difference in survivability in the Pacific. But the B-17 was not, if I had to guess, I would tell you it was spare parts. They were sending, they wanted to concentrate the spares, and it made supply, a chain of supply easier. General Cardenas, who flew both, said that this thing was a real truck to fly. He called the, he called the, uh, the B-17 a sweetheart. This mm -hmm. is so easy oh, yeah, to fly. It was. Now, the big difference combat. between the two airplanes, if you're looking for a negative, it's that the high wing loading of the B-24's Davis wing <laughs> made the airplane more of a challenge to fly. However, uh, Colonel Showers, CO of the group, is described in uh, the diary of his of his uh, co-pilot as a virtuoso in the airplane. That he could make that airplane do anything in flight and that his routine had been to train his pilots to fly the airplane like a fighter, not like a bomber. And I, I, I suspect there may be some truth to that. That may, may be the case. There, it had almost twice the wing loading of the, uh, of the B-17. So that's, that Davis wing gave you a lot of speed less drag, more range, but it came at a cost of, of, of flyability. Yeah. They said the B-17 was easier to fly in formation, which made it a favorite in 8th Air Force because those were formation missions. So that could be, that could be another reason. Yes, sir? We're thinking they were pressurized, were they? No. 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 Were they 2,800 engines on there? R-28. 1830s. 1830s. Yeah. 1830s. You didn't see the R-28s until uh, uh, the B-29. The Navy version had the single tail. Instead well, of yes and no. The Navy bought both. Uh, the, the first Navy uh, uh, of the type were actually not called privateers and had double tails just like this airplane. In fact, this is how much they were like this airplane. They were essentially this airplane. What happened was the Army was starting to find themselves stretched for pilots. So if you're in, 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 involved, interested in all that history between the wars, the Army claimed jurisdiction over all activity around our coasts, up to and including anti-submarine patrols, which meant that the Navy had to, was basically an over-the-horizon force. Right? When the war started, the Army was strapped for pilots. I mean, they were seriously strapped for pilots. So they gladly surrendered the ASW role to the to the Navy. And if the Navy would take it, the Army would give them some B-24s, which they, they took right off the production line. Here in San Diego, the, the first came right off San Diego's production line. There were B-24Ds. And the Navy never called that version of the airplane the privateer. The privateer... Uh, moniker belongs exclusively to the airplane with a single tail. Where did the world go as anti-submarine patrols to the... Sorry? Britain used a lot of... Those yes, areas. yes. These airplanes, because of their, because of their extensive range and uh, uh, bomb load, and I think to a, a, great, de a great degree their carrying abilities, uh, they, were, they were popular in closing that anti-U-boat gap in the Atlantic. G -I -U Sir. It's a story told by Charles Lindbergh that he was invited as a consultant by a consolidated Valtee to visit the B-24 factory and, and give recommendations. And he made some 24 or 30 recommendations for safety and flying ability. And his story is not one of those recommendations was put into action because they didn't want to stop the production line. This this comes up a lot when you talk about World War II production lines. It happens over and over and over again. And on some very popular types. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily use that idea, but it didn't happen on the production line. 
San Diego, most of the B-24s made in San Diego actually went through two production lines. I don't think most people understand that, but you didn't want to do, if you're turning out four bombers a day, or, or tw they got them, at one point they were doing 12 a day. That's one an hour was, during, the, during the day shift, yeah. it was rolling off the line. My uh, uh, godfather tells me that he lived in, um, he lived over in Loma Portal when he was a child, and he had a rake that he would lean on the uh, clothesline, and he would shoot down every bomber as it went over, and there were so many going over that he got tired of it. <laughs> they were really producing a lot of these airplanes. Now, to, to, to institute a change that required some kind of structural, sure. is, is not good to the, to the war effort. So what they did was they rolled these things out and then they flew them to Litchfield Park in um, uh, Arizona mm -hmm. where a second production line was done just for what they called operational modifications. And those airplanes would go in to the one end of that facility and come out the other ready to be issued. Now, the Ford airplanes didn't do that. They actually went straight from the factory to, to the units. But this was, this was a common practice. PB4Ys, we were talking about the single tail privateer. Airco, who made the turrets that went on the, on the PB4Ys, was really slow in producing the turrets and they were having problems. So they made a tailor-made plexi uh, form to go over the nose of, of, the, of the privateers as they came out of San Diego's production line so that they could ferry the airplane one-time flight to uh, Litchfield Park where it would sit and wait for turrets. That was fairly a fairly common process. They, uh, they did that with the B-29s of the four plants that built them. Three of them, if they weren't finished when they came off the line, they had to be finished somewhere it's, else. It's very common. It's, it happened with P-51 Mustangs. It happened with B-25s.